Thanks, Tom, and thanks, everyone. Um, I think it's really exciting time, and I'll try to share my enthusiasm by why I think gene editing matters and the opportunities that it offers. So the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, there's a huge amount of genetic variation that we see around the world, right? In this room, we see genetic variation, and underlying that genetic variation are mutations. It's mutations that actually underlie the genetic variation that we see. So we see it in this room, we see it in these cups of maize. A huge amount of genetic variation is underlined by mutations. And perhaps a nice example is a case of broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and so on. It's actually the same species. The same species, just mutations in the DNA that have made these changes, okay? This is man-made selection that has shifted these crops. But you can imagine if a regulatory agency, I were to go and say, I've just taken a Brussels sprout and made a cauliflower, they'd go berserk, right? It would be crazy. But actually, there's just a few mutations that humans have selected over time to drive either lateral buds to make Brussels sprouts or flour to make cauliflower, right? So this isn't showing up perfectly well, but what I'm trying to show, it should have been with a black background. I'm sorry it's not there. But what I'm showing you here is uh, the genetic code. So this is basically DNA. It's just a string of A, C, Ts, and Gs, OK? You can barely see it. I hope you can barely see it through there. Uh, so what me, what, what, at the end of the day, what, what's allowed this gene editing to happen also has been that there's been a revolution in our ability to sequence DNA. So just a few years ago, the first humans were sequenced. And when that happened, it was millions and millions of dollars. Right now, we can sequence each one of you for about $1,000. Okay? The same thing for crops and for animals. It was sometimes that it would be unthinkable to sequence the wheat genome. Well, we just completed it, and as soon as we completed it, we've actually now sequenced many of the most important UK varieties almost within months. That's the pace of technology and how it's changing, and that's how we're adapting. So if I, and the amount of DNA that's important in, in, in Matt's talk about artificial intelligence and, and thinking about big data is that you know, each one of our cells has a huge amount of DNA. So if this is one screen that has uh, a certain number of A, C, Ts, and Gs, and now we need to show over two and a half million screens to actually see how much DNA is in each one of your cells. In the case of the wheat genome, I will need to show over 12 and a half million screens to show you how much DNA is packed in one cell of the wheat genome. And from there, we need to find what each gene does and how it affects its performance in the field. But that's kind of the challenge we have. And we've succeeded in doing some of this. So Again, it's not, it's not very clear, but actually the yellow came out clearer here. Within that sequence, we can mine those millions of pages of DNA, and we can find that within that there's genes, and this is what's colored yellow here. So these are the genes that actually encode a protein, and that protein will lead to certain trait, resistance to a pest or pathogen, more tolerance to drought, better nutrition. And what happens during mutations, or what happens during evolution, is that small mutations happen, like that mutation there, a small deletion. Five bases are ex excised out of the millions and millions of bases, but that's enough to change how the plant looks. Or perhaps one base, like that little C, changes to a T. And when that happens, also the characteristics of the plants change. For example, now that plant is susceptible to a certain pest, or actually it's more tolerant to a certain disease. So now the challenge is trying to identify that. But again, the clear thing is that before, where we had very little um, amount of DNA that we could actually examine, now it's all there, and now the challenge is to identify these traits. So when we think about how often these mutations happen, I think it's really important to see what's happened out there, because we are kind of scared of mutations. But we've all mutated today. That's just a fact. I'm mutating with these lights. I'm mutating right now as I speak in front of you. But I'm repairing as well. But sometimes mistakes happen. And actually, we all will inherit between 60 and 100 mutations to our offsprings. And that's just a matter of life. And thanks to that, we evolve. Thanks to that, we evolve. The same thing happens in a wheat field. So if I take one wheat seed and compare it to the mother plant and sequence it, those two, the mother and the seed, will have between 80 and 100 mutations. And it's thanks to that that we can then get genetic gain and see new variation, and we can select for it. So actually, if you multiply that for the number of seeds within one hectare of wheat, every single base of the wheat genome will be mutated in an hectare of field. So actually, there's a hell of a lot of mutations across the UK. And this is the same thing for wheat, for brassica, and for animals. It's happening. Mutations are out there. But of course, it's hard to identify a single seed within a wheat field, right? So to put it in context of how gene editing fits traditional breeding and other sites of breeding, imagine that in the case of traditional breeding, we just take two individuals that have desirable characteristics, we cross them, and then we try to select the plant or the hybrid that has the best of both worlds. 
In the case of mutation breeding, what we do is that we take one of those uh, uh, seeds or varieties, we mutate it either with irradiation or with chemical mutagens, and then we identify this random mutation that hopefully one of them will give us a good characteristics. In the case of wheat, when I do this process, I insert 500,000 mutations in the wheat genome when I do this. 500,000, keep that number in, in bay. And hopefully one of them will be useful. We have a lot of success stories with mutation breeding. For example, pink grapefruit and others. So it does work, but it's really a random process and it's difficult to identify those things that are useful. So in transgenics, it's a little bit different because here we actually take a gene from one species and we transfer it to a completely different species. And then in this case, it's a transfer of a gene and this gives a new trait. So gene editing fits the context the following way. In this case, we have a specific variety or specific species. And what we try to do is that we try to make a specific edit in the DNA that will be targeted to a specific gene or specific region and that this will confer a new trait. And the important thing here is that genome editing is most often used or has been used to remove or alter DNA. So it's very similar to what we think about mutation breeding. There are applications also where you can make uh, insertions of DNA, but it's not something that we do routinely in plants or in animals as of yet. So the gene editing that you hear about is basically making small tweaks, small changes, or removing DNA, uh, very similar to mutation breeding. So I put the, the comment here that gene editing will re redefine, accelerate, and enhance breeding. And there's one thing to also say is that gene editing is not just one technology. There's many different types of gene editing. We hear about CRISPR-Cas9, which is the most typical one. There's CPF1, there's Cas10, there's all these different versions. But I'll show you CRISPR-Cas9. So the simple version of CRISPR-Cas9 is that. So that's a simple version, right? So, the simpler version, perhaps, and the one that actually is, is probably more adequate than this, is, is the following. So there's two components, the CRISPR and the Cas9. The CRISPR is literally a Google search box, okay? And the Cas9 is a nuclease or a molecular scissor. Those are the two components of gene editing. That's a simple way of putting it, but that's actually quite, quite real. And what we do is that now we have all the sequence of the wheat genome, of cattle, of different brassicas, and so on. We can actually put a sequence of 23 nucleotides in that little box. So out of the millions and millions of pages, we put 23 right there, and then that molecular, that Google box will find the genome, will go scan it, will put the scissor in the right place, the scissor will cut. Just like it happens with UV light and so on, it will cut. And when that happens, the DNA repairs, and sometimes it makes mistakes. But the idea is that we can now search for that mistake because we can search directly in the place that we're interested rather than doing it randomly and hoping that one of the 500,000 mutations that will occur in this wheat plant will be in the right place at the right time and so on. So this is how it is. So the guide and the Cas9. So basically you have the scissor, you have the guide. The guide takes the scissor to the right place. It targets it. Because it's 23 nucleotides, actually, if you imagine all the combinations you can make, it's extremely precise to where you want it to go. And because we have all the DNA, we know where it's going. It makes a cut. And then there's different types of scissors. Some scissors will actually make a cut. Other scissors are more intelligent, and they will just make a small tweak. They will just change one base to the other. So then how does this look like in the real world? How, does, how do we see this in the sequence? So I showed the sequence before. And when we do CRISPR-Cas9, we get the following mutation, a little deletion perhaps of five bases. Or perhaps that C, we can change it with a special scissor and change it to a T. So actually, this screen here looks indistinguishable from the screen I showed you before. And why is that? Because actually, mutations that occur via gene editing are indistinguishable from naturally occurring mutations. And that's a very important point, OK? So we cannot put all these technologies in the same box. We need to have the nuance. We need to have the intelligence to be able to say, this is how gene editing looks. If I show you the same thing with mutagenesis, with mutation breeding, it would be that plus 499,999 mutations elsewhere in the genome that we have no idea what they're doing. This is targeted to a gene that we hope to have a predictive understanding of what it's doing, but at least we can test it in a targeted manner. Just to show you a couple of examples uh, before we continue, in the case, of, this is a case uh, in Spain where they have made low gluten wheat engineered with CRISPR-Cas9. The idea here is that Doing this by traditional mutagenesis is very difficult because if you do it, you have no gluten and actually there's a lot of genes that produce this, but actually they were able to make these 23 bases to target several regions of the protein that actually make this allergenic epitope, as it's called, and by making those deletions where, which are shown there in gray, they can actually now make wheat flour that doesn't have the allergenic capacity, but it still makes proper bread. Where is this? It's being taken to the U.S., okay? 
So another example is uh, increasing grain size and weight in wheat. So wheat is a funny beast, and that's what I work on because it's a polyploid. It has three copies of every gene. So that means if I mutate one copy, I still have two copies that are functional. So many times, a single mutation is very subtle, and that's the 6%. So it's a gene that we found where one mutation gives me 6% increase in 1,000 grain weight in the weight of the grain. But actually, by using genome editing, I can make a guide. I can make that Google box, find the three genes, cut them all at the same time, and make a plant that we call triple mutant that has the three mutations. And all of a sudden, I have a wheat plant that produces, that produces seeds that are 21% heavier, and in the glass house, at least, we have not seen differences in the grain number. So now we're taking that to the field as well. So you can see the excitement of this technology, the potential, because this, poten this technology, five years ago, perhaps we couldn't have realized it because we didn't have the genes. We are not understanding them. Now that we have the genes, we have the targets, we have the technology to do it, it's really, really ripe that these things come together. So just to say the main features, so comparing with transgenics and mutation breeding, in the case of gene editing, you target one region, it's very, in a way, it's targeted, or you can target more, like the case of wheat, where I've targeted three regions. There's no uh, change, or the change could occur naturally in the uh, gene editing as it well as the mutation breeding. There's no foreign DNA, but there's one exception, there's one difference here is that to make, at the moment, to make a gene edited crop, I still need a transgenic step. So I need one generation where I can put my Google box and the scissor into the plant or into the animal. Once I make it, that change happens in the gene that I'm targeting in. And the next generation, just by Mendelian genetics, just by normal genetics, I can breed a line that has the mutation but doesn't have the transgene, doesn't have the extra DNA that has the Google box and the scissor. So by doing that, I can have a plant that's undistinguishable from the mother plant except for the mutation that we've targeted. And that's the main take home message. So with that, just to say that mutations are essential for genetic variation within species, we see it. The case of mutations that are engineered via gene editing are indistinguishable from those mutations that happen naturally. However, they are targeted. That's the key thing. We need to be careful also, it's really exciting, and you can see my excitement, but we need to be careful with the overhype. This is not going to be the solution to all our problems, but it's part of a broader toolbox that breeders have. So we need to take advantage of this. We talked about innovation, you know, and Michael Gove talked about it. We need to take chance of these opportunities and this innovation. But for that, we need a proportionate science-based regulation that allows this innovation to get to your farms. We need that science-based innovation. And it's important, and I'm really sorry that Caroline Lucas is not here. She talked about GMOs within chlorinated chicken and the hormone beef. You know, we need to be careful with putting all this together. Gene editing is a different technology, as I showed here, and we need to be sure that if we believe science for climate change, if we believe science for all this, we need to believe science for this as well. It's consensus, and we need to be not afraid to speak up about it. And the last thing to say is that it's not just about plant genetic diversity, but genetic diversity of scientists from all around the world who come here and who want to work for UK farming. So with that, just to say there's a couple of other resources there from the Wellcome Trust and the Royal Society, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Well done. Do you want to sit right